we have been in the middle of this series called um, Rebuild, or Beyond the Ruins. And we've been looking at the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is split into two parts. It's got chapters 1 through 39, and then it's got 40 through 66. And and the first part, 1 through 39, really is sort of this warning to the people of Israel. It's this warning that they have been disobedient, that they haven't done what God has called them to do. And as a result, their city will be in ruins, that there is a nation that is coming to crush and destroy the city. It's this call to the people to prepare themselves, but also to offer them a glimpse of hope that even though this is going to happen, even though they are going to be dragged from their city, there is hope for every one of them to cling to. Now, that's the first part. The second part, 40 through 66, is all of the words and messages that are spoken after this happens, after that nation comes, decimates the city, destroys everything, and drags the people off into exile. Uh, uh, 40 to 66 is the word of hope that's spoken afterwards. And so we're in the middle of that second part. We're actually towards the end of that second part. Now, last week, we looked at chapters 52 and 53, where Isaiah is sort of talking about the suffering servant who's going to come to rebuild the city, to to bring strength and healing to the nations. And as he talks about this, the first thing Isaiah talks about is this king who's going to come victoriously and exalted. And everyone thinks that they know what this is going to be like. But as Isaiah continues to talk about this suffering servant king that's going to come, you realize that this king who's coming to rebuild is coming in a way that nobody would have expected. That actually this suffering servant is going to come in the midst of uh, what looks like defeat, what looks like agony and suffering. But what's actually happening behind the scenes that you never would have expected is that God is taking this ordinary thing to bring joy, to bring victory, and to bring missional success. And we now look back at that scripture, we see that prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus, that Jesus is the one who was the suffering servant who when Jesus died on the cross, it looked like everything was sliding into darkness. But what God knew was it was actually a landslide victory because three days later, Jesus would come back, that Jesus would be resurrected from the dead, which means that any ruins or defeat or death that you and I experience will end in resurrection. That it is not defeat forever, but victory ultimately. And so what a great message. Now, as we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today, as I was preparing to talk about these next chapters in chapter um, 58 and then 65, one of the things that I kept thinking was this about was the story of uh, this memory that I have of my two little girls when they were young. Now, they're about three years apart. And I remember when my youngest was brought home from the hospital, my oldest was delighted in her. She thought she was the cutest thing. She was so excited about her being her sister. and She was protective and loving. And, and it was just so fun to watch them interact together. But then the youngest started to like move and have opinions and want things. And the oldest quickly realized that she was not allowed to just take things from the younger one. That that if the younger one had a toy, she couldn't just go up to her and be like, "Mm, that's mine, I'm going to take it. Like, she wasn't allowed to do that. And so what, what I watched happen, what I watched progress over the next little bit, over the next coming months and a year was sort of this this wheel, these wheels beginning to turn in the mind of my oldest. She knew that she couldn't just take the thing that she wanted. She couldn't just do whatever she wanted. So she had to come up with a better way to get the things she wanted. And so when my youngest would be playing with a toy that my oldest wanted, the oldest would find another toy that actually she cared nothing about. But she would take that other toy and she'd begin to dance with it and play with it and make all sorts of sounds and noise. It was normally sparkly and glitterly and lit up or something like that. And she'd be like, oh, this is so fun. I'm having such a good time. And then she would look over at her sister who was paying attention to what was happening and she'd go, oh, sissy, this is a really fun toy. Do you want to play with it? 
And little sister would immediately drop the thing that she was playing with, take the thing that older sister had, and older sister would go run and get the thing that she really wanted. And it was fascinating to watch this whole thing play out because I would just look at it go out and I'd be like, well played, well played. But my oldest daughter learned the art of manipulation at a very, very young age. She knew how to do what she needed to do in order to get the thing that she wanted. Now, as we grow older, all of us to some degree, to varying degrees, learn this art of manipulation. We know what we want and we have to try to figure out how can we manipulate the circumstances in order to get what it is that we want. Now, some of us do this better than others or more than others or more deviously than others, but but I would say all of us at some point in our lives come to this place where we figure out how to play this game. But we don't just play this game with other people. We play this game with God also. Like, I don't know how many of you have had an experience where you did, you were in the middle of like a really big bind, like something didn't go, you're in the middle of a wreckage or a ruined relationship or a big hot mess, or you find yourself down at the police station or a ticket with the police officer or whatever the thing is, like you're in trouble in some way and you really need God to do you a solid And so you do this sort of quick prayer up to God and you say, God, if you would get me out of this, if you would just get me out of this, then I'll go to church for the rest of my life. If you would just like manipulate, if you would just change this circumstance so that that this bad thing doesn't happen to me, then I will start praying. Like, God, 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 if I start tithing, I really want you to bring a good relationship into my life. God, listen, if I start going to church, I really want you to fix this job situation. We make all of these deals with God thinking that if we just play the right religious practice button, that maybe God will follow through and do the things that we really, really, really want him to do. We use all of these religious practices as as like bargaining trips in order to manipulate God so he might do what it is we want him to do. Now, at the end of the book of Isaiah, like this is exactly what the Israelites are doing. (laughs) They know that the reason they're in exile, the reason their city is in ruins, the reason their lives are kind of destroyed is because they were disobedient to God. (laughs) And so they start doing things to make it look like they were coming back to God. They start engaging in some different religious practices, prayer and scripture reading and fasting. And, 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 and so they start doing these things, hoping that God will just like make this all go away, that God will just fix it and fix it now. And God sees right through that. And so he sends his prophets to like call them out on this action. And so in uh, chapter 58, verse two, this is what the call out looks like. The prophet says, For day after day, they, the Israelites, seek me, God, out. They seem eager to know my ways. Now, when we read that first little part, you have to understand that like there's like loaded sarcasm in this. God's like saying, for day after day, they seek me, the creator of the universe, God most high, who orchestrates all things. They seek me out and they seem eager to know my ways. But here's where it turns as if, as if they were a nation that does what is right, as if they had not forsaken the commandments of its God, right? Like, like here's that thing. God's like, listen, you're like praying and you're doing the things that delight me, but you're not a righteous nation. You're not doing the things that I have commanded to do. They think that they can pressure God to comply with their human wishes, but God like refuses to be used by them. And the people, as a result, the Israelite people are offended that their religious practices aren't working, right? So then it continues. This is what he says. Why have we fasted? This is Israel talking to God. Why is it that we fasted, they say? And you, God, you've not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? See, the people are expecting that God is immediately going to turn on a dime. That God is immediately going to change what is happening because they've fasted and they've done a few of the things. 
Didn't God see me, they ask? He must really not be God because he's not working the way that I thought that he would work. And then it continues. God says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. God is calling them to task. He's like, listen, it doesn't work this way where like you do this, so I'm forced to do this. It's not some sort of voodoo ritual practice where if you do it, then, then God has to do this other thing. This isn't some sort of manipulation to get God to do the thing that you want him to do. See, God desires for us to actually fully and wholeheartedly submit to him, to, to have just practices as a part of our life, to act with justice and compassion. And what God is saying to them is, he's like, listen, you're like a little child who just hit their sibling and then said, I'm sorry, just so you can get ice cream. But you're really not sorry. You don't really care. You're not really repentant. God can see through all of that. They're just empty actions with no real repentance. And so God continues, he said, is not the kind of fasting that I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and to un untie the cord of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide poor wandering with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. God is saying, listen, the result of following God in obedience isn't that you get what you want, right? The result of following God in obedience isn't that you get what you want. The result of following God in obedience is that God gets what God wants. And what God wants is for there to be justice and compassion. What God wants is for the poor to be taken care of. What God wants is for the hungry to be fed. And so we walk in obedience so that God can get what God wants. We engage in practices like prayer and scripture reading and coming to church and tithing and fasting and all of the other things. We engage in those not so we can manipulate God and somehow we deserve what it is we want. It's so that God can get what God wants. Now I know no matter how long you've been a Christian like in following God, that can be a hard pill to swallow. It can be a hard pill to swallow because it requires you to actually trust that what God wants is something that is good for you. That what God wants is actually better than what you want for yourself. And that's really hard to trust. And if you find yourself in a unique situation thinking, okay, but, but, but you don't know the whole story. Like maybe God wants other things, but I, I really know what's good for me. Like, you are not the only one to ever have wrestled with that trust that what God wants is better for you. In fact, that shows up at the very beginning of this whole story in Genesis chapter 2. Right? Like, that's exactly what, how this whole thing got started. God creates these humans and he puts them in the garden. He says, listen, I have a life cut out for you that is perfect and wonderful and like everything will be planned out. Everything will be good. You will live forever and dwell with me and walk in this garden. You'll never have anything that you need. Everything will be provided for you. You'll experience no pain and no hurt. Just, just trust me that I have good things for you. And then this lie enters into the world that maybe God doesn't, that maybe he can't be trusted, that maybe he's keeping all of the really good things for himself rather than giving it to the ones he loves. Maybe what you really need to do is reach out and take what you know is ultimately better for you. 
And that's exactly what the first humans did. They reached out and they, they didn't trust that, that God knew best. They thought they knew better. And so they reached out and, as, and took the fruit, took the thing that God had said, don't take. And sin and death entered the entire world. All of the brokenness that we experience is a result of this sort of tension. Do I trust God that he knows what is good for me? Or do I try to make what I think is best for me happen? This is, this is the whole storyline. And we have to come to a place where we're willing to submit ourselves in obedience, to trust that God actually has good things. Not just to submit ourselves enough to manipulate God to give us what we want, but to submit ourselves to follow in obedience, to say, God, whatever you want, that's what I want too. See, that's what habits and practices are all about. Like habits and practices where we practice and pursue God. They're not about manipulating God so that somehow we can please him to make our lives more better or more like we want them. They're, they're so that we can be a people, transformed into a people that reflect God, that look like God's kingdom values so that we, the places that we live, work, and play can look more like God's kingdom, can look more like heaven on earth. Now, here at Clarksburg, we sort of define some of those values in five different ways. They're our rule of life. We talk about bless. We talk about, hey, listen, if, if we're going to journey together, one of the things we want everyone to be doing is we want you to bless three people a week. Obviously, you can bless more than that. That's fine. But we want people to bless uh, people three times a week, one inside the church, one person outside the church, and the third person can be whoever you want. But we want you to bless somebody. And you don't bless them so that you can like manipulate God to then bless you. You bless other people so that you can be transformed into a more generous person. Because we believe that the kingdom of God is a generous kingdom. And so when we become more generous, there's more of the kingdom that has come here to earth. The same thing with eating. We say, listen, we want you to practice eating with three other people per week, one inside the church, one outside the church, and then one whoever. And right now during COVID, it's hard to eat, but we're saying, listen, we just want you to connect with people, like connect with them, whether it's with a mask on or for a walk or over the phone, connect with people. And we believe that when you eat with people, you connect with them, that you become a more hospitable person. And we believe that the kingdom of God is a place where everyone belongs, that there's huge buku buckets amount of hospitality. And so we want to practice that so we become more like God's kingdom. So the places that we live, work, and play in become more like what God wants, not so that we can be, uh, we can be hosted in return. We say, listen, we want you to listen to the Spirit once a week. Now, you can do it more than once a week, but we want you to listen to the Spirit once a week. Take a chunk of time, pray, listen to the Spirit. Again, that's not so you can like punch your time clock and say like, listen, I listen to you. Now you listen to me, God, do what I want. No, it's because we believe that if we are listening to the Spirit and we're practicing doing that, we become people who are more Spirit-led. And if we are more people that, if we are more spirit led, then the kingdom of God comes even more to the places that we live, work, and play because we believe that his kingdom is all led by the spirit. We want to practice learning Christ or looking at scripture and reading, where is Christ in this? Where did Jesus show up in Genesis? Where did Jesus show up in Exodus? Where does he show up in the gospels? We want to engage in the scripture at least once a week, hopefully more, but at least once a week to learn about Christ. And it's not to put your dues in to say, well, your scripture, your chapter and verse says this, so you have to do this, no. It's so that we can be transformed to be people that look more like Christ. And if we look more like play, Christ, then the places that we live, work, and play will look more like what God wants them to look like. Are you getting it? We say we want to be sent. We want to practice recording all of the ways that God has made the kingdom of earth come, or the kingdom of heaven come to earth. We want to record all those opportunities we've had. Because when we do, we start to recognize the way that God is missionally moving us into the mission field. That God is using us to bring the kingdom, to participate in the kingdom of God here on earth.
It's not so we can say, listen, I did all of this for you, God, so now you have to do all of this for me. No, it's so that we can participate in the kingdom and the places that we live, work, and play will become more kingdom-like, more like what God wants them to be like. These aren't just things, habits and spiritual practices aren't just things that we tick off a box to say, well, I've done it, so now, God, you have to. There are things so that we become more like God, so that God's kingdom can come to earth. And that's exactly what Isaiah says in verse 8. He says it this way. He says, then, if we do all these things where we fasted, where we've given the shirt off of our back and we fed the hungry and we've given the poor a place to stay, then, then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. See, God doesn't just want you God doesn't just want to get you out of the mess that you're in. That's not what he wants. What God wants is so much more than that. What God wants is he wants to redo everything. What God wants is he wants to completely heal you. He wants to close the gap between you and him so that when you ask, he answers. He wants to be the one who guides and protects you every step of the way. He wants everything around you to be transformed and rebuilt. All of the dry, patchy, thirst, sun-scorched areas in your life, he wants to water them with streams of life. He wants to take every hurt and every pain and every place of shame, and he wants to shine his healing light into all of those things. Don't you get it? He doesn't want to just get you out of the mess you're in today. He wants to rebuild your entire life. He wants to rebuild every relationship you're a part of. He wants to rebuild every aspect of this country, of all nations, of the entire world world. That's what he wants. That's so much more and so much better than just getting you out of the bind that you're in. He wants to rebuild everything. And in verse 12, this is how Isaiah says it. In Isaiah 12, he says that your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of the broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. See, when God says, listen, I'm rebuilding Jerusalem, I'm rebuilding the old city. He is talking about Jerusalem. And in the sixth century, Jerusalem is rebuilt, right? God uh, establishes a new kingdom to conquer Babylon, Persia, and he moves the people and the king and moves the king so that the people can head back to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. That's what happens in Nehemiah and, and, um, and Ezra, in the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. But God is talking about so much more than just rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. God's talking about rebuilding everything. If you turn a little further in the book of Isaiah, if you get to chapter 65, Isaiah begins to talk about something even more that's going to happen. He begins to talk about a new heaven and a new earth that's going to be established that God's going to rebuild everything. He says, see, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And Isaiah begins to talk throughout that whole chapter about how what he is going to do is like God's going to build this new heaven and this new earth where there's no more pain and there's no more death 
and there's no more wars. That instead, God's kingdom will f- of heaven will fully come here to earth, that God will dwell among his people. Now, the fascinating thing is that this is the exact description that we see in Revelation 21. Revelation is the last book of the Bible that kind of talks about like, hey, this is what we can hope for. This is what we can expect. This is what's coming. And in Revelation 21, what, what John writes in that book is that he sees the new heaven and the new earth coming. He sees it has been established here on earth that there's no more pain and there's no more death. See, that is ultimately our hope. That we do have hope that in our lives, God is piecing back the ruins. But the ultimate hope, the ultimate joy, the ultimate thing that we cling to is that God is working to transform the entire world. And it begins with you and it begins with me. Not in doing empty rituals and prayer practices that are just, trying to manipulate God to do things, it begins with us living as kingdom people. It begins with us daily practicing the habits of the kingdom. And as we practice those habits, we begin to see that the kingdom has come more and more and more and more. And this is the invitation that you and I have been given through Jesus. That if we are followers of Jesus, it's not just an invitation to do all of these things so that we can get what we want. It's an invitation to follow Jesus so that God can get what God wants. The rebuilding of our entire world to bring heaven to earth. And really, that is the invitation that is open to you and to me today, to all of us. It's because of Jesus that this invitation is available to us. Now, I know for some of you, you might never have heard of this invitation before. And I am praying that today is the day that you say yes. That you say, yes, I will follow Jesus. I will repent and I will follow Jesus, not so that I can get what I want, but so that God can get what he wants, which I know is ultimately beautiful for both you and I. Now, I know that others of us, we've made that commitment to follow Jesus long ago, but perhaps there are some ways in our lives that that we've sort of slipped in to doing these things just so we can get what we want, rather than so that God can rebuild our whole lives. And so my invitation for you today is that you would have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, To say, hey, listen, in my relationships, in my workplace, in my own life, in my prayer practice, all of these things, I see the ways that I've just wanted what I've wanted. But that today would be the day that you let those things go and you say, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to practice these things, not just for me, but, but ultimately for you so that the world can be transformed. And that's my prayer for you today. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you are a God who who can see right through us. Because if you couldn't, I know that I would be a person who would manipulate all the systems to get what I wanted. And I'm not the only one. But you are a God who sees through that and wants so much more than that. And so, Father God, I ask that we would be a people that cling to the hope that you are doing so much more in the midst of these ruins and of these rebels, that you are working to rebuild heaven and bring it to earth. And so, Father God, would you convict us of the places in our heart where we have, um, where we have just not trusted you, of the places in our hearts where we've said, no, 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 I know a better way. I know how this really should go but Father, that we would humbly on our knees repent and that you would be a God that speaks truth to us, that offers us forgiveness and that ultimately rebuilds all of our lives. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.